In studio with the Hall, the uh, I almost called him the Hall of Famer, the New York Times best-selling author John Gilstrap, who may be in the Writers Hall of Fame someday, but not yet. Were there one, I might be in one. <laughs> and also, my Jefferson County prosecuting attorney Matt Harvey. Matt, thanks for being here. Glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, added Art Tom to the conversation as well from the NRA. Arthur, good morning to you. Good morning. How is everybody? We are marvelous. Thanks so much for joining us. And also Doug Smith, a Republican from the 39th, who yesterday watched as his teacher, Carrie Bill, passed the House 89 to 11. Uh, Doug and Art, what is the next, before we get into some more specifics about this bill, what is the next phase for this bill? Does it move on to the Senate? Uh, yeah, it moves over to the Senate, and then once it's uh, introduced, uh, probably introduced today, and it'll probably be assigned out to one of the committees, and they'll probably take a look at it, and if they decide to take the bill up, then I'm sure they'll have some tweaks to it, and based upon conversation yesterday, there's a couple tweaks that can make this better, and I fully support anything that you know can improve upon the bill. And, Doug, could you give us the specifics of the bill? And, Art, feel free to fill in the blanks uh, as you need to. Go ahead, Doug. Well, it's simply this. If uh, the bill passes and this is, uh, and we get this into law, a teacher can volunteer to be a, uh, a SPO and a security, uh, school protection officer. And if they volunteer, then they would go through the uh, training. And I need to uh, clarify what I meant on uh, the 24 hours. It's not to exceed 24 hours of training uh, for the initial stuff. And then an additional four hours are not to exceed four hours that the school can do some specific training there. Um, once they've done that and received their certificate and a weapons qualification is part of that initial 24 hours, then they would submit that to the school board and with the, um, you know, that they've completed the course of training. And the school board would then uh, submit that information up to the state and it would be distributed out to local law enforcement. Is there a provision for continuous training, uh, basically like CE, like lawyers or doctors or pharmacists have to do every year so many hours to keep current? Yeah, they would have um, a um, annual re uh, qualification training, and that's not to exceed eight hours also. And that would be for every year they wanted to be that teacher who is licensed to carry? Yes, sir. And is there any limit on the number of teachers in a school who could get this authority? There's no limit, and I'm glad you asked that question because even if a teacher doesn't want to carry, just taking this training would be beneficial to the teachers, to the staff, and to the children there because, like I mentioned before, some of the training in there would be trauma and first aid and, and just other mitigation techniques and the accountability and reunification after the, the uh, event. Could school service personnel or admin also attain this uh, license? Yes, it's for uh, teachers, uh, support staff, and also for the um, um, uh, administrators. Is it limited to full-time employees, or could a substitute teacher also do this? Uh, the bill that we had didn't specific specifically address that, but if there's a uh, substitute teacher there and they've met all the qualifications and training, um, as far as the bill doesn't say they can or can't, so they most likely would be allowed to. Will the teachers be publicly identified and known as who has uh, actually undergone this training and permitted to carry in school? Absolutely not. And the reason for that is for their safety and for the safety of the students also. Go ahead, Matt Harvey. Uh, good morning, Delegate Smith. Uh, real quick, where is the 39th District? By the way, uh, that's down in uh, Mercer County. Um, it, basically, it's a swath right through the middle of the county that runs from, if anybody's familiar with Mercer, it's from Oakvale up through Athens, where Concord College is, uh, Camp Creek, uh, the park that's there, uh, Matoka, Spanishburg, and then out to the Wyoming border. I, I grew up in Peterstown, so I'm pretty familiar with that area. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, especially uh, my mom's from Oakvale. Um, and I looked at your your Facebook page. So you you have military experience. You're a retired military officer. Could you give us a little background yeah. on that? Yeah, uh, spent 34 years in the service. Uh, I was prior enlisted as a combat medic because I was 
too short to be a military police, but they don't have a height requirement for officers. So went to college through ROTC and then uh, got commissioned and retired back in 2018 as a full bird colonel. Now, th- West Virginia wouldn't be the first state to allow this, correct? Oh, absolutely not. There's uh, currently 33 states out there that allow teachers or staff to be armed in some manner or another. And as we talk today, West Virginia and two other states are looking, the legislatures are looking at uh, doing this right now. So that would raise it from 33 to 36. And an interesting thing about this is there's states out there that already allow this that might come as a surprise to people where I'm talking like, uh, you know, when we talk about red and blue states, you've got states like Colorado, Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, Vermont. They're all part of that 33 that currently allow it. That allow it. Yeah. Go ahead, Art Tom. What were you saying? Yeah, I was saying New Jersey. He's, he's absolutely correct. You know, it's, it's one of those things where I've seen across uh, Twitter or X now, um, you know, people responding back and forth and reacting to this bill uh, passing the House yesterday. And some of the things that people are saying is West Virginia doing West Virginia things and, uh, and making this like a very deep red um, uh, issue, a Republican issue, or, you know, when it comes to pro-gun versus anti-gun, things of that nature. And, and what was surprising to me, even, you know, the reaction of the uh, – the, our, our Democratic friends in the in the legislature in the West Virginia House is how they came across yesterday um, in a way that it was, you know, um, outlandish. And as uh, Delegate Smith pointed out, when when you think about it, and you think, well, states like Delaware, Massachusetts, New Jersey, um, Connecticut, you know, areas that that are, uh, you know, Vermont, which Vermont had constitutional carry forever, but. Um, they're certainly not necessarily pro-gun. Um, these aren't states that anybody ever thinks that, that they're sitting on the front lines of being pro-gun. And these states allow um, their teachers and staff to be able to uh, to protect their students um, if the need were, were to arise. And that's all this bill's talking about. It's not talking about, uh, you know, being the next pro-gun measure. Uh, it is is simply to protect the children in areas where we're not able to currently. I, this is John Gilstrap. Um, I want to get back to the training uh, issue, or training program. Um, I, I've done a lot of firearms training, and I can testify that not all training programs are created equal. Some are, are very good, and, and some are sort of feel like a rubber stamp. You said something beginning that kind of concerned me a little bit. I might have been, uh, misinterpreted. You said that people go and they get the 24 hours of training and then they bring the certificate to the school board who then blesses it or, or whatever whatever happens at, at that point. Are we not designating specific areas of training that have, with specific um, providers so that we know that everybody's getting the same level and the same detail? Well, the uh, training itself, um, let me let me back up. I wanted to add something to what Tom had mentioned um, about some of the other states, and it kind of leads into this topic. A number of those states that, that Tom mentioned and a whole bunch of other states that uh, are part of that 33, some of those states only require the teacher or the administrator or the person carrying the weapon to have a concealed carry permit, and that is it. No additional training or anything. So when I looked at this bill, to me, we do need to have some training because of the the type of situation that it is and the uh, you know the aftermath and and those kind of things. So that's why I wanted training into ours, but I didn't want it to be so restrictive that nobody would ever volunteer to do it because uh, if you put the hours out there and make it 80 hours, two weeks of training, somebody just can't volunteer to do. Uh, along those lines and what you asked about on let's see the other part of the training um do people get their own training or yeah or or go ahead do people choose their own training outlet and bring a certificate or do you tell or do we tell them where to go to get their training oh Okay, yeah, that's where the uh, the director, as, as in the bill, we had the director of the West Virginia Justice and Community Services section, and that's underneath the uh, Department of Homeland Security. They will be 
uh, establishing the program of training that will need to be conducted, and then the training will actually be conducted by the local law enforcement who are the first responders to the schools um, that the teachers are volunteering from. So that way they're getting the training actually from the officers that would be uh, the ones responding to the event. See, I, I think that's a, a really smart thing because not only are will the teachers be trained in the local police uh, procedures, but also they'll they'll know who these individuals are, so you don't end up with a friendly fire, uh, less likely to have a, a, a friendly fire situation. One last question, anyone to go, Matt? But if, one last question: if if a teacher has a concealed carry permit but doesn't want to go through this training, so and is therefore armed in the school, are there repercussions for that? Is that still illegal? What's what's That's the situation? That's still illegal. Okay. That's still illegal, and I would hope that uh, they're not doing it. We all know that there's probably some people out there that are doing it because they're concerned for their safety and, and the safety of the students. But I would like them to you know, go through the formal procedures of, of getting the training so they're better – uh, trained and, and understand, you know, how to react in in the situations. Matt Harvey. Well, so when, when I when I asked about whether or when the question was asked about their identities, will it be known who's carrying? There was a pretty strong no. There's not. But what, does that mean that the training will have to be one on one with the with the local police agency, so the other people that are carrying can't be identified or? Um, no, it, amongst the people that are uh, carrying, that needs to be a coordinated uh, okay. effort. Um, I don't think that was clear. Even if there's a, already a, uh, a resource officer or somebody in the school, it doesn't prohibit a teacher from also being there, but it specifically states in the bill that if there is a teacher armed and there's a SRO, uh, or a, yeah, an SRO or, or um, um somebody else armed in the school that they must coordinate every day with each other so people know you know so it's it's known amongst the, the law enforcement and the people that are carrying the principal of the school and the superintendent they're they're allowed to know okay. but just the information on pe who's certified and all that with out in the public is not to be released uh, um, or students specifically yeah, yeah. not to release to the students either you're aware of certain tweaks that you anticipate coming from the Senate uh, in their discussions. What are those? Um, so some of the ones I, – I'll let Tom – I'll throw that one back at Tom because he's looking at it from, uh, you know, tweaking this out so it's a little bit better that way. Arthur? Okay. So some of the things uh, – and to address the questions earlier, a couple questions earlier, um, I've spoken with, uh, you know, uh, Senate President Blair and some of the others. It looks – like the uh, the bill is currently going to be uh, referenced, double referenced first to, to judiciary and then to uh, to the committee on finance. Um, reason being is uh, one judiciary is where we're going to hash out you know the the different amendments to the bill, and then uh, finance would address uh, the potential uh, fiscal note, if any, there. So um, one of the first things is that there's a circumstance that in the bill that it says that you have to have a concealed carry permit issued by the county in which you work and uh, that's not the way it works in west virginia you're issued by the county in which you reside um, and then there are plenty of of uh, school employees that live in one uh, county and work in a different uh, county certainly we see that in uh, in the eastern panhandle as well um, so that will be changed to any concealed, valid concealed carry permit um, because, look, you know, as long as you have a concealed carry permit, you've went through the training, um, that, that's, that's good enough. It doesn't have to be county-specific for sure. Um, some of the other things that we're looking at is uh, the, the training and the cost of the training. Currently, there's a provision set in the language that uh, provides $5,000 to, uh, to the county for them to implement this, uh, which comes out to, uh, you know, roughly $275,000, um, give or take the, you know, school for deaf and blind and some of the other stuff. But the, uh, uh, we're looking to, to potentially adjust that as well. There's uh, some of the states like Colorado, for example, again, not a bastion for, for, uh, for gun rights, um, but they have a, a program called Faster Colorado, and they have multiple levels of training, um, and it costs, 
a thousand dollars for the for the first level one training, and then uh, six hundred dollars for each level two, three, and four, um, which could be uh, you know the uh, the ongoing training type of thing. Uh, and in those circumstances, the, you know the schools can either take that on as an invoice, um, you know, to pay through their their standard security training that they do now, or there are several uh, different uh, opportunities for um, uh, different grants and, uh, you know, scholarships, if you will, um, to pay for those. Um, and there's pl- plenty of uh, donors across the country uh, that put into these pots to be able to pay that. Uh, so we may be able to um, to eliminate that fiscal note altogether, um, and it if so, then we may be able to dispense with a second reference to uh, to the committee on finance and uh, and put it on the floor. But again, those are things that have to be worked out. Um, I have meetings on Monday to, to uh, with uh, senators and Senate leadership to to start working on that and uh, trying to uh, adjust the bill to the point that it, that it's a uh, it's a good solid uh, bill that that if passed into law uh, can can be um, put into place uh, without any hiccups. Matt, you had a follow-up? I did. Uh, this is for either one, but but I have a question about the the the, fire, the actual firearm and the ammo. Is that going to be provided, or is there going to be some sort of regulation? I, I can see, like, you, you don't want somebody like like a, like on Police Academy where you have Tackleberry pull out a fifty caliber, <laughs> you know, Desert Eagle. or But, but you also don't want somebody – to pull out a gun that's like a, you a know, 25. Y- yeah. Yeah. That's not yeah, sufficient. It, it would have to be, it would be their personal, their personal weapon because it's uh, concealed and it would have to be the size that can be concealed. And I, yeah, I we're not, I mean, and, and here's the thing is, is and provided by the, the, the person who wishes to carry, correct? Correct. That's right. You're right. It's going to be a, it, yeah, just like uh, most circumstances, it's going to be uh y- y- in all the states that do this, there's no state that provides a firearm for the teacher that I'm aware of, um, and nor ammunition. And, uh, you know, anybody that goes to the courses and the classes, uh, this isn't a circumstance where you come out the other side of it thinking that you're going to put a, you, you know, a, a 454 Casul on your uh, on your hip and, and carry it around concealed uh, within, even out in the public, right? I mean, I don't know anybody that personally that that walks around and that's their everyday carry um that's going to get very very heavy and very very cumbersome very very fast but uh you know so um i think that uh in that's never been an issue in any of the states that uh, that have passed this i don't anticipate that being an issue here in west virginia either talking with our tom lobbyist for the nra doug smith he's the delegate retired colonel out of the 39th delegate district here uh question in regards to those teachers who volunteer to do this goes through the training are armed and then hell comes to their school what is their obligation once this goes wrong what happens if they decide they don't want to respond so here look here's the thing um just like every other instance when you're concealed carrying and, and uh, you know a firearm in the state of West Virginia, you have the the right uh, to be able to protect yourself, your family, or any other person while you're in a witness of a forcible felony, right? So you can you can meet uh, force with equal force, or you know utilize deadly force in that scenario. But it, it nowhere in the code does it does it say you're required to do so. Um, you know, you know the hope is that you've been trained and you're able to. Uh, to act on that training and to protect those children uh, in their time of need. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, you're, they're not going to go to jail if, if they don't. Well, in the Supreme Court, the pre, um, Supreme Court has already decided that even police officers do not have an affirmative obligation to intervene with an ongoing crime. That's right. That's right. There are, yep. The Supreme Court yep. has ruled on three different occasions that, 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 uh, that law enforcement has absolutely no duty to protect it, the uh, so as they say to serve and protect, sure, but the the Supreme Court doesn't require them to do it, and you know and there's certainly several reasons outside of just the uh, being fearful of of why they ruled that way, you know. So Art and Doug, we have Good Samaritan laws that protect me if someone's having a heart attack and I go and try to provide CPR and it doesn't work out. 
and I caused some damage that maybe led to a death. We have Good Samaritan laws that protect me from being liable for trying to help somebody. Are there any types of protections in place for someone who wants to do this and the worst scenario comes out where they pull their weapon, they shoot, and another kid or another teacher gets shot mistakenly? What are the protections for that person? That, so, you know, one of the things that uh, currently there are, are no uh, protections in place anywhere in law uh, in the state of West Virginia for a scenario such as that. Um, you know, one of the things that you're always taught in every scenario, I've been an instructor for a very, very long time, is know your target and what is beyond. Um, you know, if you're not safe to, make the, to take the shot, you do not take the shot. Um, and, uh, and that would be driven into, uh, in, into the minds and into the core of, of these classes as well to say, look, if, if, if it's not safe to draw your firearm and, uh, and take the shot, you, you do not do it. Um, and, you know, in the state of West Virginia, and I, I say this all the time in all of my concealed carry classes, um, if, you know, you have the right, if you're in, uh, you know, a gas station down the street and somebody pulls out their gun to, to rob the place, you have the right to be able to draw your firearm and, uh, and you know, neutralize that circumstance or that situation. But understand if, uh, you know, Mary Jane's walking by and your bullet, your straight bullet hits her, you went from good guy to bad guy really fast. Your protection, you went from totally protected to not protected immediately. Doug, I have 30 seconds left. Your final thoughts on this. And. The biggest thing is a lot of people are making this about guns and gun safety and, and, you know, kind of getting into the emotions on that. And I just want people to realize this is just one more thing, uh, looking at behavioral issues with the children, looking at hardening of our schools. I agree with all of those, but we need to look at anything and everything that's available to us out there to protect our kids. And this is just one more thing that we can do to protect our kids and our teachers and uh, ensure that they have another day of, of instruction and education. Doug and Art, thank you so much for your time this morning. Very much appreciated. Thank you all. Thank you very much.